Scientist Eating Conference, and we are ready for our second presentation. It's going to be James McWilliams. We are just so grateful that he has come all the way from Texas to be here with us today. Uh, he's the author of four books on food and agriculture, including A Revolution in Eating, How the Quest for Food Shaped America, and more recently, the book Just Food, Where Locavores Got It Wrong and How We Can Truly Eat Sustainably. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Slate, and Forbes, and he posts regular columns to Atlantic.com and his own blog, eatingplants.org. Uh, he's a professor of history at the Texas State University and lives in Austin, Texas, and we are so grateful he's here today to talk about the alternatives to the alternatives. Please welcome James McWilliams. Now, how's that? There, there we are. The, um, sitting out here, I realized that the only uh, drawback, I think, to hearing Karen Davis speak is having to go after her. Uh, it's a wonderful talk. Grateful for it. Well, as Hope said in the introduction to the conference today, there's, there's really a lot to celebrate when it comes to our growing awareness of factory farming. Mainstream consumers are, are really finally becoming attuned to the horrible impact that industrial animal agriculture is having on the environment and human health and, and animal welfare. We're realizing that raising billions of animals a year in dreadful conditions has dire impacts that reverberate throughout society in many, many ways. We're turning our outrage onto corporations that profit from this explo exploitation. Corporations from Monsanto and Smithfield Foods to McDonald's and Jack in the Box, where I read the other day you can now buy a bacon milkshake. <laughs> so one could say that consumers have reached a crossroads, uh, a point at which, given the obvious harm being caused by factory farming, a critical mass of us are rethinking our relationship to the industrial food system as well as the billions of sentient animals imprisoned within it. This is undoubtedly a good thing. It's cause for celebration. The problem, though, is that most consumers who have taken a close look at industrial agriculture and been appropriately appalled have chosen to seek alternatives and options that come with their own lexicon of, of virtuous buzzwords, but do very little to confront the harsh and very powerful reality of industrial agriculture. Influenced by the Omnivore's Dilemma, Food Inc., and the food media in general, more and more consumers are choosing local, sustainable, and more humanely raised animal products. And they're choosing them as viable alternatives to industrially produced animal products. We're choosing meat and dairy produced on smaller farms, often by people that we know, sold at farmer's markets and co-ops, or even you know, sold directly from the farm itself. With remarkable success, these products are promoted as existing outside the industrial supply chain. And as a result, they're promoted as a legitimate and meaningful way for consumers to vote against industrial methods of production. Implicitly or explicitly, these alternatives brand themselves as a fundamentally new way to bring meat, eggs, and dairy to our plates. In general, we've bought this storyline with minimal reflection and minimal critique. My argument today is pretty straightforward. My argument is that buying alternatively sourced animal products from small, local, sustainable farms is an entirely an adequate answer to the hegemony of industrial agriculture. Granted, these alternatives enjoy enormous support from the foodie media, environmental groups, and even uh, advocates for animal welfare. But this alternative path in the long run, the local, sustainable, more humane path, will lead right back to where we started. It will do precious little to help the fate of farm animals or the environment that we share with them. 
In fact, no, many, no matter how many happy stories we tell, the small-scale alternatives, precisely because they continue to reduce animals to their instrumental rather than their intrinsic value, will only perpetuate the very system of factory farming that so many of us want to see abolished. That's my argument. If it isn't clear by now, I should explain that I'm here with an agenda. Um, I'm trained as a historian, you know, I'm sort of schooled as a scholar, but I, I really speak as an activist. Several years ago, I took, uh, for, for somewhat random reasons, I ended up taking a very close look at all forms of animal agriculture. And it did not take me long to reach the conclusion that any unnecessary exploitation of animals to provide food we don't need was by any moral standard wrong. My goal is thus to convince you that the only way to truly fight factory farming, the only way to viably confront the deep evils of industrial agriculture and the current state of our food system, and the only way to prove, to really act upon our purported concern for the welfare of farm animals is not to eat them or their products. This is an issue that brooks no compromise. Until we make this leap, every act of resistance Every dollar spent on local meat, every backyard hen raised, and every condemnation of factory farming are little more than empty, symbolic gestures. Gestures designed to make us feel better about the suffering we continue to perpetuate. For me, everything begins and ends with this. Animals are sentient. They have intrinsic worth. They deserve our moral consideration. They've never given their consent to be treated the way we treat them. And therefore, out of respect for their inherent worth, the least we can do is to stop directly exploiting them for food we do not need. I tried to, I tried to do something very clever and boil it down to um, something like eat food, mostly plants, not too much, you know? <laughs> but it took me about 10 times as many words to get my point across. I'm going to build my case on three arguments. First. When we choose alternative options, we're engaging in inconsistent welfare consideration for the animals we claim to care about. One philosopher has called this moral schizophrenia, seeing it as a pathology of sorts. Think about why we dislike factory farms so much. Much of our disgust boils down to the way animals are treated. They're overcrowded. They cannot run free. They cannot eat what they want. They cannot physically reproduce on their own. They cannot pursue any of their natural inclinations. They're forced to live in squalor. They're caged. They're confined. You know that story. We all know this situation well just by virtue of being in this room. Now stop and think for a moment about why. Why does that bother us? Why does that situation bother us so much? Why do we hate? so much to see animals treated as badly as they are in industrial settings? Why do films of animal abuse deeply upset us? Well, I would say that we hate to see animals treated like objects because we know that they are not objects. We know that they're living, sentient beings capable of feeling pain and suffering and experiencing pleasure and excitement. The more we learn about animals, in fact, the more they amaze us and remind us of our shared evolutionary heritage. We object to factory farming because we know that these animals are ultimately worthy of moral consideration. They deserve to be treated well because they matter. Emotionally, morally, individually, they matter. If we don't understand this intellectually, in other words, if we haven't taken the time to actually look into the science of the emotional lives of animals, or the social lives of animals, or the intellectual lives of animals. If we haven't done that, we still kind of get this intuitively. And this is a wonderful realization. I mean, this, is, this is really an optimistic commonality that most consumers have. It shows that we know farmed animals have feelings and emotions and intelligence. It shows that we know that they have individual awareness and consciousness. They like to play. They do not want to be harmed. 
This is why we think it's horrible for them to be raised in factory farm settings in the first place. This is precisely why so many of us are outraged at industrial agriculture. We recognize on some level that their quest to live is just as powerful as our quest to live. We care deeply about animals. In fact, for the animals lucky enough to live with us, companion animals, many people in surveys claim to love their companion animals more than the people that they live with. True. How, then, can we simultaneously nurture this belief in the moral worth of animals so much so that we act upon it by rejecting factory farms and then turn around and support an alternative system that, when you break it down to its essential outcome, does the exact same thing. Small farms might treat animals better than factory farms. I'm not going to downplay that, that the significance of that. I'm, I'm aware of that. In general, small farms really are far more attentive to animal welfare. But don't be fooled about the primary reason that most small farms exist. They seek the same ultimate goal as factory farms, and that is raising animals to kill, commodify, and send to market for food we do not need. They tell a better story, and they take better pictures. There is no doubt. But it's the same game. This is what I mean by selective moral consideration. So before we indulge in the local, sustainable, small-scale, humanely raised alternatives, before we buy that story, we have to look closer. We have to deal with our real dilemma. Is it possible to care for an animal's welfare and, at the same time, kill it for unnecessary purposes? Is that possible? Can you justify that? We're in the midst of a food movement that is not only wildly popular, hugely influential, but doggedly seeks a just food system as injustice. Never, ever, however, does this movement explore the conundrum that I'm presenting to you right now. That has to change. The answer really is, is no mystery. No, no truly ethical framework would tolerate a market-determined death for an animal we claim to care about. But this is exactly what the alternatives not only allow, but encourage. Buy heritage turkeys on Thanksgiving. Good for them. Never underestimate the importance of this basic similarity between factory and alternative farms, nor the power of the human mind to think it away. Um, I was on a radio program about uh, two months ago, and it was a, uh, a guy running the pro radio program was also a pig farmer, a small pig farmer in Vermont. And he, we got into a discussion about what I'm talking about right here, and the um, the, you know, I sort of brought up the, well, well no, he, he was talking about how humane his methods were, and, and indeed they seemed to be. I mean, it seemed like he was raising some pretty happy pigs. And this guy, he, he said, you know, I care so much about my animals that, you know, I've arranged for a mobile slaughterhouse to come to my farm because I don't want my, you know, that's not true. He said he tried to arrange for a mobile slaughterhouse to come to the farm, but he couldn't get one to come. And he then said, I don't want my pigs. I care so much about my pigs that I don't want them to, to travel. That's, that, that's going to make them stress. And it, it indeed is a horrifying experience for, for farm animals to take the trip to the, to the slaughterhouse. So he wanted to avoid that. He cared about his animals so much. He cared about his pigs so much that he tried to get a mobile slaughterhouse to come, and he just decided he wasn't going to drive them, put them in a truck, and take them to a slaughterhouse because it would be too upsetting to his pigs that he cared so much about. So I asked him, what do you do? Or actually, somebody called in and, and said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I, I take out a, a, you know, a, a Sharpie, and I put an X on, it, on their foreheads, and I, I shoot them with a 22. So again, this juxtaposition of, of concern for an animal's welfare and the ultimate fate sometimes hits home. Uh, you know, it would be comical if it, if it wasn't. So to conclude my first objection, I ask you to think about the following questions. Do we really want to build a new system, an enlightened system of agriculture on the back of this moral inconsistency? 
Even granting that the animals in the system have a decent quality of life, do we want to rebuild our food system on the premise that just as in factory farming, a human who owns an animal can end that animal's life because there happens to be a market for it? Who are we to say that we respect an animal and then kill it to sell at a restaurant that will charge a mint because it was humanely raised? I don't want the future of food to be based on this kind of paradox. My second claim is that we inadvertently support factory farming when we buy alternatively sourced animal products. Our choice to seek alternatives is often couched in activist terms, okay? We want to oppose factory farming, so we're going to buy local. Because we know the farmer and we trust his methods. But I would argue that by eating animal products from small, local, alternative sources, you're not opposing factory farming at all, but you're actually indirectly supporting it. This is a bit counterintuitive, but let me, let me try to develop it. It all comes down to who's defining the implications of your choice. The food movement has argued that your decision to eat alternatively sourced animal products means you're sticking it to industrial agriculture because you're supporting a fundamentally new approach to food. The media reflexively promotes this idea, mainly because there's really good copy in it. The small farm narrative has this kind of David and Goliath ring to it that the media simply cannot resist, much less be critical of. So there are lots of forces out there investing the alternative choice with virtue and enlightenment and empowerment. You're sticking it to industrial food. Well, I've had the benefit as a kind of moonlighting journalist to talk to a lot of people in big agriculture, in the food industry. I've talked to the executives at Cargill and Tyson's and Smithfield and Monsanto and Syngenta. And I can tell you something. Industry invests your act with an entirely different meaning. From industry's perspective, your decision to continue eating animal products, even if they are from alternatively sourced farms, is great news because it directly reinforces the most fundamental prerequisite for factory farming, and that is the belief that there is nothing wrong with eating animals per se. As long as this belief remains intact, as long as this belief is not fundamentally challenged, the meat industry, which you will recall produces 99% of the meat and animal products that we eat, will continue to thrive. What big agriculture fears is not alternative agriculture. They can always co-opt that if they need to. It would take nothing for them to do that. What they fear is the emergence of a pervasive plant-eating ethic. <laughs> big agriculture fears a total rejection of what big agriculture produces. They fear veganism gaining the popularity of go local. This is what keeps them up at night, because this is what would put them out of business. So if you really want to stick it to industrial agriculture, if you hate industrial agriculture that much, quit eating the products that they make. Simple as that. You know, this is this, this driven home, like this fear, this fear of like, what does big industry fear? Was driven home to me in a number of ways. I mean, one, I'll, I've just asked a lot of executives, hey, what do you think of these small scale farms? They, they laugh. They're like, they're great, whatever. I buy from them, you know? <laughs> wonderful. Um, but, you know, it's when you bring up veganism that their face kind of drops. <laughs> this was driven home recently, I, I think, maybe not as explicitly as, as it seems, but when this guy in Vermont, Vermont again, when this guy in Vermont was making these t-shirts that said, eat more kale, perhaps you read about this, uh, and he was, he was uh, served a cease and desist letter by Chick-fil-A which has a, I guess, an advertising campaign that says, eat more chicken, and it's this, you know, cows writing, eat more chicken on a, on, a, on a board. This was their advertising campaign, and they thought that eat more kale was a threat to eat more chicken. Um, I mean, to me, what I, what I saw there was this, this um, any attempt to kind of popularize a, um, a vegan ethic was going to be um, jumped upon. They're not, they're not going after small farms. You know. They're going after any hint of a plant-eating ethos. 
So when you support the consumption of animal products, which you do when you buy them from big or small farms, you reiterate an ingrained and culturally sanctioned practice that serves to keep big business in power. Unless eating animals is morally stigmatized, sort of like smoking is today, unless our food, and sorry, unless our focus on where food centers, unless our focus on where uh, food comes from centers on the ethic, ethics of eating animals, factory farms will always remain the dominant mode of production. I believe this more than anything that I've written. As long as we eat animals, there will be factory farms. The reason for this opinion is not only cultural, but it's economic, too. In a capitalistic society, unfettered demand for anything provides the political and the economic and the technological incentive to do what? To produce more efficiently. When it comes to raising animals uh, efficiently, scale economies always, always win, resulting in profound welfare atrocities for the animals we claim to care about. As long as there is demand for animals, the principle of efficient production will prevail. It will always be applied to animals in an economy bound to the principles of the free market. To think that small farms can escape this economic reality is simply naive. There is no basis for that belief. As small farms proliferate, as they respond to increased demand for humane alternatives, the result will be what? Competition. Among alternative farms, for a growing demand for their products. The outcome of this competition, this is Economics 101, according to every economic model created, with the exception of communism, will be to seek improvements in efficiency to generate more product for less. The cycle of efficiency would spin, resulting in denser, more streamlined farms that, in the name of efficiency, but under the guise of welfare, took less and less interest in an animal's natural inclinations. In no time, we'd be back to the large-scale systems that the small farms were designed to oppose in the first place. How long would that take? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? I don't know, but it can move in no other direction. So go ahead and erase, go into your fantasy world, go into that fantasy part of your brain and erase factory farming and envision a land of small, decentralized farms. You're gonna end back up at the factory farming. With India and China about to usher hundreds of millions of consumers into the meat market, to think that small farms will proliferate, remain small and decentralized, and not compete for market share is a willful distortion of thought. We've already seen it. I mean, there are examples of this. Anyone who knows the history of organic agriculture can look at where organic agriculture started and look at where it wound up. It's highly industrialized to today. Um, the industrialization of organic vegetables or fruits doesn't bother me that much, but it bothers a lot of people who supported the small-scale, decentralized version that prevailed in the 60s. More recently, we've seen this scenario play out with um, a very popular, I'm going to be sort of discreet here because I'm writing an article about this right now, but with a very popular um, purveyor of humanely raised meat. They started very small, uh, made no money. Um, this label then decided it was time to make money, so they started to grow. They're profitable now, and they started to grow. And the whole apparatus of the humane meat industry supports that growth. So if you look at all the certification labels that are out there today, humanely certified, you know, American Humane Certified, uh, GAP Certified, whatever, um, all these small guys, as they grow, as they compete for market share, as they become more industrial-like, all they have to do is just find a certifier who will do what they want to do, allow them to do, and give them the stamp of approval. So the entire apparatus just grows as well and gets watered down as well to support this movement away from these founding ideals. OK, my third and final reason for opposing small-scale animal agriculture, and actually just kind of a thought popped into my head here before I get into this. Um, hopefully it's clear to you, and I'm trying to be quite explicit about this. The, the decision to criticize these small farms is fraught with all kinds of um, possible misinterpretations. And one that I get all the time, I mean, I actually have a little folder for this in my email uh, is, uh, account, is uh, a shill for industrial agriculture. And, and you have to understand that just because I'm up here criticizing these small farms that we all know and love does not mean that I'm supporting industrial agriculture. But in any case, my final reason for opposing small-scale animal agriculture is that eating animals is environmentally unsustainable. 
whether the products come from big or small animal farms. We know the ecological impacts of factory farming are horrible. We hear this all the time. Livestock produces more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector of the global economy, including transportation. 80% of the antibiotics produced are consumed by animals. The vast majority of the world's genetically modified corn, corn and soy are grown to feed animals. Uh, virulent influences, influences breed on factory farms. Manure lagoons destroy aquatic ecosystems. I mean, on and on and on. It takes 2,500 gallons of water to produce a pound of beef. It takes about 13 gallons of water to produce a pound of tomatoes. I mean, I could spend the next hour rattling off these statistics. I think everyone knows that raising animals industrially to feed 7 billion people is, by definition, an ecological catastrophe. Well, contrary to common assumptions, the alternatives aren't much better when it comes to their environmental impact or safety record. You would never guess this by reading conventional media reports on small-scale agriculture. This is an issue that's either not ex properly explored or it's distorted. With grass-fed beef, there's a methane problem. Cows that eat grass produce three to four times more methane than cows that eat, that eat grain. With free-ranged animals, there's a land problem. Um, much of the Brazilian rainforest right now is being depleted to provide land for grazing increasingly popular grass-fed cows. And the more and more I look into the land requirements to truly allow, say, pigs or, or, or chickens to, to behave in a natural manner, it's, it's remarkable how much land is needed. So to think that we can just switch over to these free-range systems or these pastured systems that are truly allowing animals to behave in their natural, according to their natural capacities, is naive because we just don't have the land for it. Diseases also prevail in free range systems as well as in factory farms. And I'm, you know, as a historian, I'm aware that if you look at something like pig farming, one of the reasons why, ironically, American pig farmers began to confine their pigs in the first place was to cut down on rates of trichinosis. Uh, animals that were grazing in natural environments were acquiring rates of trichinosis that the Americans didn't care about it, but they were sending pork to Germany. And the Germans actually said to the Americans in the late 19th century, look, we're not going to buy your pork anymore if you don't confine your animals and pay attention to sanitation. Of, of course, that model reached unsanitary proportions after a while. But the point here is that free-ranging systems open animals to disease in, in many ways, uh, just like confined systems do. The work of Peter Davies at the University of Minnesota shows that, somewhat horrifyingly, confined pigs are pound for pound safer to eat, at least in terms of trichinosis rates, than are free range pigs. And then there's a the thing that nobody talks about, dead stock. What do you do with the dead animals? What do you do with the carcasses without rendering plants? It's virtually impossible to find an affordable rendering plant today because of mad cow disease. That has put rendering plants out of business. It used to be you send your, carca uh, your carcasses to a rendering plant. You send your dead stock, which is often 40% of the animal, to a rendering plant, and it winds up, I don't know, in your shoes or your headphones or something like that. You know, it gets turned into a bunch of industrial byproducts. But those aren't available right now. And what's happening now to dead stock is they're getting bulldozed into landfills. This is a problem that nobody ever talks about. You know, the food movement is all about the supply chain. Let's look at the entire supply chain. Well, let's look at it. You know, let's look at the breeding facilities. And let's look at where the animal goes when it's a bunch of bones. Let's look at that. It looks very different when you do that. The environmental problems uh, become quite, quite um, obvious. So again, um, right now, these alternative systems that I'm, that I'm spending all this time talking about are really only about 1%, 1 to 5% of the, the meat and animal products being produced. So we don't see these environmental problems that I'm talking about here. Scale it up. 10%, 15%, 20%, and they will become quite visible. We'd find ourselves confronting the same problems we had hoped to eliminate by seeking alternatives. Again, that cycle, that same cycle back towards the problems of factory farming would kick in. Comprehensive studies support the argument that the alternatives offer little by way of environmental improvement. And I'm just going to cite a couple of recent studies here. One recent study by the World Preservation Institute confirmed that a global, this is actually quite amazing, 
a global vegan diet of conventional crops, of conventionally raised you know, plant crops, would reduce dietary emissions by dietary emissions, so all the emissions attributable to food production, would reduce dietary emissions by 87%. This figure is compared to 8% for sustainable meat and dairy. If, or, uh, if organic plants were eaten, emissions caused by food production would actually drop 94%. So this is really quite an astounding testament to how um, polluting animal agriculture is. Another study done by scientists at Carnegie Mellon University calculated that a vegan diet was seven times more energy efficient than a diet that sourced a normal meat-based diet within 100 miles. Again, further challenging this notion that as long as you eat local, you're eating uh, sustainably. Yet another study comparing the greenhouse gas emissions of grass and grain-fed cows found higher rates of greenhouse gas emissions of grass fed cows rather than grain-fed cows. And this was due to a number of factors. Um, one, that be as grass-fed beef becomes more popular, a lot of farmers are actually taking land and, and fertilizing it to grow grass. Uh, and that fertilizer, of course, comes with a cost. Another is that grass-fed cows take longer to come to slaughter weight and so produce more emissions over the course of their, of their lives. Um, so these alternatives, in short, are no answer to the environmental impacts of food, of animal production. The best answer to the environmental problems caused by the production of animals is, once again, not to eat them. So to recap my argument, the alternatives to animal agriculture are often promoted as the answer to the many and very serious problems of industrial agriculture. My argument is that these alternatives do very little to confront, and in some cases they actually perpetuate the problems of industrial agriculture. Selective ethical considerations, the perpetuation of an animal eating ethic that equates small scale and industrial agriculture, however unintentionally, and environmental limits that cannot be scaled up are just three reasons why the alternatives with which we're so currently enamored will do so little or nothing to change the industrial food system or substantially improve the lives of the animals that we consume. As I said at the start, though, there's good news. And the good news is that we're at a crossroads. We are aware. We know that factory farming is not acceptable. This is a starting point for meaningful change. So the next step, I would argue, is not to become compassionate carnivores and support alternative systems but to do the most effective thing a consumer can do to dismantle industrial agriculture as we know it, improve the health of the environment, and most importantly, do right by the animals we repeatedly insist we care so much about, and that is to become uncompromising ethical vegans. How to promote this? How to promote ethical veganism? It's a topic I'm going to end with. I can say it's one of the most difficult questions I've ever grappled with. Um, seems very clear to me when I made that decision, but the more and more I talk about it, the more and more I engage with people over this issue, the more I realize the battle is really just, just beginning. Um, so trust me when I say that I'm the first to know that this is a tough sell. I, um, you know, even institutions that, whose causes would greatly benefit from promoting veganism won't do it. Um, despite the overwhelming, just to give you a few examples, despite the overwhelming medical evidence supporting the benefits of a plant-based diet for our hearts, the American Heart Association has said, yes, there is a lot of evidence out there that this would be good for people and that it would low, radically lower rates of heart disease. I mean, they've acknowledged the science, but then they've said, well, we're not going to officially recommend it because it's, quote, too hard for people to follow. How very lame. <laughs> the environmental benefits are equally obvious. I mean, I just gave you a bunch of statistics. But yet again, those who would seem to be the most logical choices for promoting veganism won't do it. The World Watch Institute recently put out a report on the environmental problems of meat production in a world of 7 billion people. And then it concluded, somewhat astoundingly, that we need to eat more meat. It just needs to be organic pasture raised. That's all. <laughs> and you're okay. Of course, we don't have the land to support that. 
Um, that's ludicrous advice to give. 350.org, Bill McKibben's organization. I wrote a whole article about this, and I said, Bill McKibben, go vegan, or at least, at least come up with a little wing of 350.org, this environmental organization. At least this little wing, and say, this little wing of my organization is going to be dedicated to promoting a vegan diet because I am concerned about lowering greenhouse gas emissions, and a vegan diet would dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions. And I wrote this article while Bill McKibben was going to Washington, D.C. to get arrested over a pipeline, uh, the extension of a natural gas pipeline. So we don't use natural gas and we burn dirty coal. I mean, it's just hard to understand why. Uh, and so I, I, I asked, why not just ha do that? And the email I got back was from a, a, a staffer at 350.org and just said, we are not into that kind of thing. <laughs> it was, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, but it was basically like that. It was one line, not our thing. So what this resistance tells me is that not only are there ulterior motives at work within these organizations, fundraising, media attention, I mean, getting arrested and getting on the front page of the New York Times for opposing the extension of a pipeline is going to draw a lot more attention than staying at home and eating kale. <laughs> but the personal health, what I've learned from this is that personal health and environmental responsibility will never by themselves be sufficient motivating factors to initiate a lasting and meaningful change or shift toward veganism. Neither of these factors alone will tip the balance. They belong in the overall push towards veganism, but they're not going to do anything meaningful, permanent, or sort of, um, I guess, uh, grab a number of mainstream consumers on their own. Instead, a significant shift to veganism will only happen when we fully recognize the intrinsic worth of animals. We must turn our attention to the animals. This is where we have to direct our efforts. Just as slave abolitionists once fought valiantly to convince Americans that slaves were human beings with intrinsic worth, so must vegans can work, fight, to convince Americans that non-human animals are beings with intrinsic worth. Animals, in essence, need their Uncle Tom's Cabin, their narrative of a life of a slave, their newspaper, The Liberator. These texts, look at what they did historically. These texts sparked passion in the hearts of people who once slumbered under the cope of unspoken evil. These works brought moral clarity to those who've been living with and accepting slavery as an unthinking decision. Just as the way things were supposed to be. What was once hidden in plain sight became, with these works, exposed in an emotive, morally charged kind of way. And within a couple of decades, the world turned upside down. Ethical vegans must promote full compassion for animals, not because they are like us, but because they are sentient beings. We'll never truly have a morally healthy society when we live in denial of the mass slaughter we execute on billions of innocent, sentient, emotionally sensitive animals, no matter how well we raise them. As when, as compassionate citizens, we, become to, we come to see that an ethical consideration of an animal's intrinsic worth is inherently linked with an ethical consideration of a human's worth, radical change will, fo will follow. Speciesism is racism, is sexism, is homophobia. Tip one domino, in this case the most helpless domino, and the others will follow. Let me put it a little differently. Recent science has shown that farm animals have an ability, we're just learning this, even hens, have an ability to distinguish their handlers, the people that are around them, as individuals. They recognize their individuality. Shouldn't we do the same for them? I mean, can't we at least give them that? The final benefit I would mention about veganism is that, with respect to food, it is the absolute purest and most powerful form of activism. And it's available to everyone, right here, right now. Billions of animals are killed every year. This mass slaughter is at the core of industrial agriculture. Do we really think that hundreds of thousands of concerned consumers buying locally sourced, humanely raised meat are going to do anything significant to alter the fate of these billions of animals. We have to move beyond this boutique form of activism. We have to take stronger action. Slow food, sustainable food, local food, whatever. Ethical veganism cuts to the heart of industrial agriculture like nothing else does. There is nothing more direct you can do to fight industrial agriculture than to go vegan. And this is what we need to start talking about. We're always going to hear about the alternatives, but there's more than one way to vote with our fork. 
Taking on factory farming is a battle, but taking on eating meat and animal products is the real war. Until we realize what we're fighting for, we are, to use the phrase, fiddling around while Rome burns. Thank you very much. So I guess I have about eight minutes for, for questions, and I'm happy to, and unfortunately I have to run out right after this talk to get to the airport. So your hand went up first, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it came up last week in a talk I gave at, at Wesleyan University. It was the same thing. It's like, who are we talking to here? And one of the criticisms that I actually get from a number of food writers is, hey, why is McWilliams picking on the one percent of these good guys? Well, I'm not really picking on them individually. I'm actually trying to reach the audience of people who are interested in purchasing sustainable, alternative, humanely raised animal products, because they're the ones whose consciousness are already raised. And you know, my, my, my belief is that's a great start. You know, we're, we're angry with factory farming. We want to see that end. And the reason why we want to see that end is because we care about animals. And so we're looking to these alternatives. And I'm just saying, look, we're at a crossroads, OK? And we're going down the wrong, we're going down the wrong road, that's all. So I feel like a prerequisite has happened with, this, with a group I'm trying to reach, which is you know, we're, we're, they've already flipped that switch. And so I'm just trying to push people in what I think is the better, a better direction. Um, now, the, the other thing about like where it goes from there, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I spoke to a group of college students like last week, and I'll tell you what, like college students are, this, this is the Occupy generation, like they're about fairness. And, and it was wonderful because they're like, well, you're saying this and, and we can do it here in this room, but uh, can a hunter in sub-Saharan Africa do it? And, and, and of course the answer is, well, well no. You know, I, I don't know how we're going to get from the group I'm talking to to the world at large, but I know it happened with the abolitionist mentality very quickly. And, I, and I'll just make one more comment. You know, I mentioned Uncle Tom's Cabin. I mean, that was a really profound book because what it did was it took basically the middle class who were kind of northern middle class who looked at slavery as something in the abstract because they'd never seen it. And they understood that it was brutal, and they understood there were problems with it, but there was no emotion or sort of uh, uh, moral anger behind slavery. But what that book did was say, hey, you know what slavery does? It breaks up families. And then these, you know, these middle class, particularly women first, said, oh my gosh, and they started to see slavery as a moral issue. So unexpected things can happen. And this is why when Harry Beecher Stowe met Abraham Lincoln, he said to her, so, so you know, you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this war. Uh, yes. Sure, yeah. I mean, I get the argument all the time, too. Uh, rotational grazing, we're improving the land. Um, the first thing I would say about that is it, it, it takes extraordinary management skills to make that happen. And, and very few people who claim to be practicing rotational grazing are necessarily doing it um, in the best possible way. But that's not really the important point here. 
what I will often say is, okay, if you believe that indeed you need you know, an, an, an animal rotating through your agricultural system to make it work, then allow the animal to live a natural life, rotate through the agricultural, um, rotate through your agricultural system, live the entirety of its life, die and rot into the soil. Like it used, like, like that's how it used to happen, right? That's why we have grasslands in the Midwest, because buffalo died and they rotted into the soil and kept the grasses healthy. So, you know, if you really do believe in rotational grazing, then do it and let, the, and, and if you really do believe that animals are there to produce manure so you can grow food, then, and then treat them as manure producing machines. Don't kill them and commodify their flesh and use them for their products. And what they'll say is, well, I can't make a living that way. You see? And so, okay, so it is about economics. It's not about ethics. So, I mean, that's, that's what I say there. And the other thing is that, you know, if you read Just Food, you'll know that I'm not, I'm not fearful of using um, agricultural technology to do things like produce fertilizers that, uh, to replace manure. Uh, I interviewed a lot of, of scientists when I was writing that, soil scientists when I was writing that book, and one of the things that I learned was that, you know, there's, when we talk about fertilizer, when we talk about synthetic fertilizer, we're, we're usually thinking of this very cheap, uh, environmentally damaging anhydrous fertilizer that hits the ground and all the nitrogen runs off, but there are very effective synthetic fertilizers out there that are far more environmentally sound, that are much more in tune with the crop that they're growing, so I'm not averse, personally, to taking that kind of approach. I mean, agriculture is an artificial act to begin with. If I have no problem using these, you know, quote unquote, artificial technologies to improve it or make it more efficient, um, I just don't want that applied to animals. Uh, and manure, you know, the idea of like needing manure as, an, as, a, as a necessity for having agriculture is, is, is also, I think, dubious because you need a hell of a lot of manure. And, and if we have the synthetic, you know, a bag of fertilizer versus, you know, two tons of manure, and we're talking about, uh, oh, there was, a, there was a true story about a, a Cornell scientist who went to, I think it was Bangladesh, and was going to teach them organic farming and quickly realized they didn't have trucks to pull thousands of pounds of manure up hills to fertilize the farms. And so, you know, 20 pound bag of fertilizer did pretty well. So, I mean, that's one way to go about it. You may or, not be, may or may not be comfortable with it, but I think. Um, if you look into um, matching, you know, the pl plant's nutrient needs with, with fertilizers, you can do it much better with synthetic fertilizers, in, in my opinion. Okay, there were some hands up back here, and I really have like one, maybe time for two more questions. Yes? Yeah, no, it's it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I would say that my, I'm not in, in any way familiar with, you know, the, the global religious text, but I know enough about the Bible to know that you can use it to either justify slaughtering animals or not justify slaughtering animals, it's depend, depending on how you read the book of Genesis. The same with slavery. I mean, the book of Paul was used to justify slavery, it was also used to to uh, oppose slavery. So, I mean, I think at least within Christianity, there's room for biblical interpretation that cuts both ways. I know for sure that if, you know, you read somebody like Matthew Scully or you read Andrew Lindsay, who's a philosopher uh, who writes about animal suffering at Oxford University, you will find a, a very powerful Christian argument for, for not eating animals. Um, so, and I think within certain religions, it can cut both ways. There are also religions, of course, that have a very strong ethic towards not eating animals, uh, particularly a lot of Asian religions. Um, now, in terms of maybe more extreme examples, I don't know. You know, like I said, I'm reaching the group that I can reach right now. I have no idea how the ripples are going to, how far they're going to go, when they're going to go. But I do know that change, even people who justify um, 
I mean, I still think it's wrong. I don't care what your belief system is. I still think it's wrong to kill an animal. Uh, I, I don't see how you can. I think any sort of system of ethics that somehow sees that as a positive good uh, is a system of ethics that needs some revision. I will say that. Um, so I can't tell you. I mean, if, if there's a, a group that you know, a, a sort of group that believes that this is integral to their religious belief, I just hope that changes occur. I don't know how they will occur, but changes occur to challenge that in a way that perhaps turns the battleship slowly within their cosmology. It's the best I can do, yeah. Okay, one more question, and then, yeah, we got to wrap it up, I think. Yeah. Well, okay, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, a kind of kinder, gentler approach, but you know what? I have no problem with hitting hard, and people can ignore it. Yeah. No, and then, and then they, but 10 years, 20 years later, that, that sticks with them. I mean, that happens a lot. So, I mean, look, you're not going to Socratically, uh, I, I think, change, change people's minds. Um, I, I think you have to hit very hard, be as explicit and aggressive as you, uh, to match your beliefs, and people can reject it for now, but you can hope that down the road, they will maybe remember one thing that you said, and um, a new world will open up for them. That's all. I, I need to end right there, I think. Thank you. Yes, thank you, James McWilliams. Let's give him a big round of applause.